Welcome to our Wednesday Bible study on January the 10th of 2024. Glad you're tuning in. You might want to be opening your Bibles to Acts the 22nd chapter as we'll continue our study here. Lord willing, we'll finish out chapter 22 and get into the first few verses of chapter 23 as we tie all that together. While you're turning in your Bibles there, uh, let me invite you to our in-person Wednesday Bible study. Every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. We are studying in the book of Matthew and that in-person Bible study. We take time to sing songs of praise to God. We take time to pray unto our Heavenly Father, especially for those who may have a certain prayer request that evening. And so we'd love to have you come and be with us on Wednesday nights. Also on the Lord's Day, every Lord's Day, we assemble together for a 10 a.m. Bible study, which currently we're studying in the Minor Prophets, the book of Amos to be precise. As we're going through that study right now, we're we're set to begin Amos chapter 2 this coming Sunday. Let me also invite you to the in-person worship service. I know we live stream on Sundays on Facebook, but we would love to have you come and actually be with us in our worship service on Sundays at 11 a.m., a period of worship where we engage in all the activities of worship that God has commanded us to engage in the way God has told us to, to engage in them. And then again on Sunday evening at 6 p.m., we, we enter into another period of worship that evening. So we'd love to have you come and be with us for any of those occasions, all of those occasions if you're available, especially if you're in this area. Now let's turn our attention back to the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, as we have been studying it for about a year now, we want to remember what has occurred. Now, obviously, as the book opened, we had the ascension of Jesus back to Jerusalem or back to heaven, uh, departing, leaving his disciples in Jerusalem, set to preach that first gospel sermon in Acts 2. The church began, the kingdom came into existence. That spiritual kingdom was in reality now in this earth, in the world. And that kingdom is going to advance. It advances first in and around Jerusalem and Judea with the great persecution. It extends to Samaria. And then as Acts chapter 9 opens up and you have the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, whom we affectionately know as Paul the Apostle, you're going to begin to see the gospel go to the uttermost part of the earth. That's exactly what Jesus said he desired it to do, that it would do in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. And so as we've been studying here lately, we had been looking at the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul, three of them to be precise. The first one in Acts chapter 13 and 14. The second one began at the end of chapter 15 and extended to uh, right around chapter 18. With chapter 18, it came to an end. The third missionary journey started taking us into uh, chapter 19 and 20, and then it concludes in chapter 21 when he arrives back in Jerusalem. Now, Paul had planned in ending that third missionary journey to come back to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, an occasion where he would be able to preach to the Jews, his fellow countrymen whom he loved dearly and desired them to be saved, and then make another journey, this time going as far as Rome. He had already sent a letter to them preparing the way and, and expressed that desire to get all the way to the capital of the Roman Empire, the seat of world power in that day, the city of Rome. Well, unfortunately, as we've seen things play out here in Acts 21 and 22, things didn't go the way Paul desired them to go. And now he has been arrested. The, the clamoring of the Jews, the mob... Uh, activity of the Jews arrested the attention of the chief captain, the Roman official charged with maintaining peace, maintaining order. He arrests Paul. Paul had asked for an opportunity to speak, and where we had left off last week was Paul addressing that Jewish um, uh, mob that had had really laid into beating him. And they stopped because of the presence of the Roman soldiers entering into the picture. And Paul begins to speak to them. And so where we left off last week, Paul had, had been addressing the, the matter of his life, how he had 
with the Jews persecuted the church, persecuted Christians, and then also spoke of how he had seen Jesus alive after his resurrection. Remember, he was a witness to that. He was an apostle, one that was born out of due season, but nonetheless, as he told the Corinthian brethren in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he was not one whit behind the chiefest of those apostles, and thus he had a responsibility uh, to be that witness, which he is on this occasion. And we talked about how what Paul is doing differs from what the modern concept of, of testimony uh, happens to be. The, the whole idea of the denominational testimony uh, of one's salvation experience, which is not in any way the same thing as what Paul did here. And actually, as we pointed out last week, has no foundation in Scripture whatsoever. Everyone is saved in the same fashion through their adherence to the tenets of the gospel, to the gospel plan of salvation. Now, as we get down to it, we're looking at Paul's words now as to how he will eventually get to the Gentiles. But before we do, I want to I lay down an excursion that uh, I intended to get to last week but ran out of time. And notice in Paul's words here in chapter 22, as he is talking about his background, his pedigree among the Jews, and how he was taught at the feet of Gamaliel in verse number 3, he was zealous of the law and zealous uh, toward God as every one of those Jews that was now clamoring for his death actually uh, was. He said, I was just like you. I had the same thought processes. I had the same belief structure as you relative to Jesus of Nazareth and that which was produced by him. And he says in verse 4, and I persecuted this way unto death. The zeal that Paul had led him to this far extent of even killing those who would be of that way. And he, he speaks specifically about Stephen and then what he did in going to Damascus as is outlined in chapter 8 and chapter 9, well, chapter 7, 8, and 9 of, of, this, of this book. And I wanted to make just a point here about what Paul says about that way. Paul expresses this means or this idea of Christianity as a way. And the word way from, from the Greek hodos, actually means a, a progress, a road, a journey. And it, it's figuratively used to express a mode or means of life. And I, I think this is a point that so many in the religious world miss. There are countless number of individuals who have a conception in their mind that once they have secured, as it were, a salvation from Jesus, once they and, and I'll use the term feel, even though the scriptures don't address salvation as something you feel, uh, as something you get in some mis mysterious, mystical way, there is a thought process that heavily uh, infiltrates the religious world in a denominational uh, way of once I get that feeling that I'm saved, once I have that so-called experience that, that guarantees or confirms that Jesus has saved me, then there's nothing I can do to lose it, and there's nothing else required of me. Perhaps maybe there's a little bit of a understanding of moral life to be lived, but then really the, the uh, practitioner of that concept lives the way they see or they designate to be the right way to live. And, and with many of these kind of individuals, there is a lack of knowledge of the Bible. They think they know the Bible. They'll address themselves to know the Bible. And this is something that you and I also have to consider. How much do we actually know of God's Word? How much have we, uh, time and energy have we invested into knowing what God requires of us as it's laid out in the Bible, in His Word? particularly in the New Testament. I want you to think about a passage of Scripture with me in the book of 1 Peter. And there's other passages we could talk about. I, I mean, think about what, what Paul said in, 
in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 6 through 8, when he, he addressed his life as finishing his course, the idea that he had a course to pursue, he had a course to run, he had a, a path laid out that he had to follow, he addresses his own life as a path to, to proceed down as a way, as a mode of living. Uh, you could think about what uh, Jesus said in Matthew 7 when he talked about the broad way and the narrow way. And he said, enter in at the straight gate. Well, entering is the beginning point. That's where you start. And it leads to life eternal. But as a starting point, he says, continue down that narrow way that leads unto life. And he says, there's only a few that find it. Most are on a broad way that leads to destruction. Everyone is making progress towards some destination. There are those on the broad way advancing toward the destination of destruction, and there are that few that are on the narrow way that leads to life. But Jesus presents it as a journey. He presents it as a road to travel, a way. Now, listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4. He, he, we'll begin in verse number one. He says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, because Jesus has so suffered for you, there is a response that is demanded of you or that is that you are uh, needing to, to, uh, to follow. There is a response that is worthy to be granted or given uh, unto Jesus because of what he suffered. For as much then as Christ hath, hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. This individual who has ob obtained or who has made use of this suffering of Jesus he suffered for us so that we might have the forgiveness of sins so that we might have salvation. And now, because he has done that and we have responded to uh, that in the correct way, we then are no longer going to live to the lust of the flesh, to the lust of men. We're not going to let the flesh, the material world, this fleshly temporal life dictate how we conduct ourselves going forward. We're going to live according to the will of God. Well, the only way you're going to know God's will is to investigate the scriptures because therein is God's will revealed. He says, for the time past of our life may have sufficed us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, to have worked out or done the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excesses of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. And he says, you're dead to those things in verse number uh, six. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to, to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. So those things that we once did, he says, you stop doing those. And so we're going to walk in a different way that is dictated by the will of God. Paul addresses that in his speech in Acts 22 by saying, I persecuted this way, this way of life, this mode of living. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 21, for our conversation is in heaven and of course, from there, we look for Jesus to return or to come again, that second coming, so that we then can be with him. But our conversation is in heaven. And there, the, the term that is translated conversation more literally means our, our citizenship. And as a citizen of heaven, our citizenship being spiritual, our citizenship belonging to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of of his dear son, then that is going to dictate how we live our life. The life of the Christian is to be conformable to God's will, transformed to the world, not fitting the mold of the world, but fitting God's will. And thus, Christian life is something that is demanded. It's something that we must do. 
And, and so salvation doesn't just happen and then nothing else changes. Uh, salvation having been granted by having our sins washed away in the blood of Jesus, as we talked about uh, in Acts twenty two sixteen last week, and how in so doing we call on the name of the Lord, we'll rise and, and wash away our sins, calling on the name of the Lord, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Having done that, our sins being washed away, we now walk in that newness of life according to Romans 6, but we're going to walk. We're going to continue in that newness of life because now our our citizenship is heavenly. And we recognize that we're just strangers and pilgrims here in this world passing through, but we're going to conduct ourselves according to the will of God. We're going to fit his mold, not the mold of the world. And I think that's something that is often missed. People don't recognize that living the Christian life demands a changing of, of our priorities, a changing of, of the way we, we talk sometimes, the way we uh, live sometimes. We're going to now have to comport ourselves as citizens of the kingdom. And anything short of that, we're not going to be found pleasing to God because we must be walking that narrow way. So salvation isn't something we achieve and and then never lose or nothing else is is demanded of us rather it's a beginning point we enter in to that narrow way through that narrow gate with our obedience initially but then we must pursue we must walk we must continue to follow that course and and throughout the book of acts i think we've already mentioned it before but throughout the book of acts luke presents christianity as something that is life-changing, but something that is pursued through life, something that that dictates a, a way of life that provides the means and the way that we are supposed to live. So let us not lose sight of that. Now, as we continue with, with that thought, let us now look at, at Paul's road to the Gentiles as as Paul in, in Acts 22 was laying out uh, his, his beginning point as an apostle of Jesus, one who had seen Jesus alive, he is then going to say, it came, this is in verse 17, it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. We know that after Paul's conversion, he did make his way to Jerusalem. Now Galatians chapter 1 and 2 Helps, helps us understand that a little better in a timeline. We talked about it with Acts chapter 9. You might need to go back and review those particular ideas or those uh, the understanding of that timeline. But there is this time in which Paul is in Jerusalem, and, and now he tells us in that time he was praying in the temple, and the Lord told him to, to make haste and get out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. He was told by Jesus that these Jews were going to be unwilling to, to respond favorably, to accept what Paul was going to be teaching unto them. They would not listen to what Paul was going to explain concerning the gospel. And so he says, Lord, they know that I in prison meet in every synagogue them that believed on me. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I, was all, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And it seems that Paul has an understanding here that, that they will be sympathetic to him because he was once one of them. And as being one of them, he is going to now be received in, in now presenting his understanding of things currently. But Jesus is affirming to him they won't. That won't matter to them. In fact, it's going to prove to be a a substance that that actually garners more bitterness and hatred against them than they had against Peter and Andrew and James and John and others. And so think about one thing that Jesus said with that. A prophet is not without honor save in his own country. Things that Jesus said when he returned to his hometown of Nazareth, but they rejected him. He began to explain to them in Luke chapter 4, that, that he was the fulfillment of that messianic prophecy. He read to them from the book of Isaiah and said, it's fulfilled in your ears this day. 
And then they looked around and said, well, hey, now, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this one who has been with us uh, throughout his life? How can he be the fulfillment of that? And they rejected him. And even at that point, to to the extent that they would have they would have thrown him out, they would have cast him down headlong uh, off the cliff. They would have put him to death. And so Jesus m- removes himself, and and he says in that instant, a prophet is not without honor save in his own country. That sometimes it's hard to go home again. That those that that you think know you and and you could have an effect upon. Uh, because that's your home place, that they may not listen to you as you think. And and everywhere else, he might be honored. He might be revered. He might be an individual that is listened to, but in his own hometown, his own home country, in this case, Paul, in Jerusalem, they're not going to listen to you. So he is told, depart, and I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Now, what Paul is trying to express to them is the reason he went to the Gentiles with his message. He's, he's saying, I went because I was commanded to. This was the will of God that the Gentiles hear also this message of salvation, a point that these Jews were bucking for a long time. And one of the reasons that they were so adamant against Paul is because they believed that he defiled the temple by taking a Gentile in. But yet, when they heard the term Gentile, we're looking now at the reaction. We know how Paul ended up among the Gentiles. It was the will of God. He was always going to be that vessel by which the gospel was going to arrive among the Gentile nations, among the Gentile world. And when the Jews heard that word Gentile, that that word, now remember they had quieted down in order to listen because Paul spoke in the Hebrew tongue. But the moment the term Gentile was spoken, uh, verse number 22, they gave him audience unto this word and then lifted up their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. The minute he said Gentiles, they were ready to see him put to death. They, they claimed that this, this man didn't even need to continue existing in the world, such vitriol, such hatred now for the Apostle Paul because of one word, the word Gentile. And as you think about that, Paul is certainly now um, receiving that venom uh, from them. And and it reminds us that, that sometimes, as they're ready to kill Paul, those best fit for man's good those best fit for mankind's good are sometimes the ones that are most despised and hated. You you consider this. What Paul is presenting to them is the best news that they could have heard. Jesus died for them. Jesus was dwelling now in heaven as the Messiah. He is both Lord and Christ. The, the best news that they could have heard, your Messiah has, has come and, and he has paved a way by which your sins can be forgiven he, he has a message that is in the best interest of these people. But they hate him and they despise him. And, and sometimes uh, even we can fail to see the benefit that people offer to us because we're clouded with, with uh, prejudice against them. We're clouded with, with hatred against them. We despise who they are and where they came from and thus we will not listen. These people hated Paul. He had been one of them, but now they had developed a hatred, and while he offered them what they needed the most, what was for their good, they were ready to kill him. Sometimes the most significant people in our lives can be the ones that get treated the worst. Sometimes the ones that we need the most are the ones that we despise the most. And so let us be very careful with our reactions to other people. Let us clearly look into and consider the benefit that is coming to us by those that are around us, lest we be the ones like these Jews that are guilty of despising the very ones who have our best interest in their mind. So just a a quick note about that, something to consider with all of those that we come in contact with every day. Now, 
That's the reaction of the Jews. Then we have the reaction of the chief captain because the, the mob escalation begins again. The chief captain commanded uh, Paul to be brought into the, capital, into the uh, castle, that tower, and he's going to scourge him. He still doesn't know. Keep in mind that the chief captain is a Gentile himself, a Roman official. And Paul was speaking in Hebrew, so he may not have understood anything that, that Paul was saying to the multitude. He just sees what reaction the multitude has now again began to, to hurl at, at Paul with their venom and their vitriol. And so he commands that Paul be scourged for examination. Now, the idea of scourging here, it could be employed by Roman officials, uh, it was a means of getting a confession. They would literally beat the confession out of you. And, and of course, in that, in that circumstance, sometimes they might get a false confession for the sake of bringing the scourging to an end. Understand, this scourging process was, was very violent and very intense. The, the Roman officials in scourging had no type of restriction as God put on the Jews. Remember when Paul said of the Jews five times received I 40 stripes save one in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23? Well, there was no such restriction. This scourging was sometimes so violent. It was so uh, harsh that a lot of those that were scourged ended up dying. It was such a process that, that could rip and, and tear at the skin that that the organs from the inside could protrude through those lacerations. And so he is going to command Paul to be, to be scourged in order to get a confession out of him. So uh, as they're preparing Paul for the scourging, verse 25, they bound him with thongs or uh, strips of leather. Uh, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? So Paul introduces the fact to this centurion. Now the centurion and the chief captain are two distinct people. The chief captain is the one who is commanding the centurions who are in turn commanding a hundred soldiers each. And so as he's given the command, one of these centurions gives order for his soldiers to bind Paul and ready him for scourging. The centurion is most likely the one who will uh, inflict the scourging upon Paul. Well, Paul mentions to him, uh, what you're doing here, is, is it lawful? And Paul is, is in, in a roundabout way, letting him know, I'm a Roman citizen. Now, this would be something that would be easy to check. They could look at the census rolls and determine whether Paul was a Roman citizen or not. But what does that have to do with this situation? Well, first of all, uh, let, let's mention that there are a couple of ways here introduced in the passage by which an individual could be a Roman citizen. Because once Paul puts that information out there, the centurion tells the chief captain, you might want to be careful what you do with this man. He could be a Roman. And so the chief captain then is going to address Paul. How did you acquire your Roman citizenship? He understands he's a Jew. So he's not a, a Roman uh, individual. He's of the Jewish nation. The, the chief captain can, uh, can see that. It's clear uh, uh, that the nationality that Paul is, and being a Jew by nationality uh, does not make him a Roman. And, and in the mind of the chief captain, it excluded him from being a Roman. However, he does question, how did you get your Roman citizenship? And he indicates that he acquired his by one of the, the two ways that's in the passage, and that is by a large sum of money. That citizenship could be bought. Now, in that way, that Roman citizenship, albeit Roman citizenship, was seen as, as a inferior form of Roman citizenship. If you obtained it by purchasing it, then somehow that was less uh, desirable than another form. And, and so Paul is going to address that. He, he says, uh, I was freeborn. 
And the idea of being freeborn is that he was born in one of two options. Either his parents were Roman citizens, or one of them was. In this case, was Paul's father a Roman citizen? And that's how he obtained it? Or was it the fact that he was born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, which that is also the case. So in, in regarding Paul and his Roman citizenship, either it was uh, given him because of being born to a Roman citizen, or it was because he was born in a free city. Either way, his citizenship was obtained in a way that was seen as, as superior to the way that the chief captain did. But either way, that citizenship was had by the Apostle Paul, and that gave certain guarantees. Four things about that citizenship as far as benefits. Number one, you had the right to vote. They were able to vote in Roman elections. Number two, they could not be bound or imprisoned without trial. Well, keep in mind here with Paul, he has now been bound. They haven't even got to the scourging part yet, but he has been bound. He has been shackled or he has been tied up in prison, basically, which was a violation. He hadn't had a trial. He hadn't been condemned. And so the very fact that they have tied him up stands as a violation. And thus, at this point, the chief captain could be in, in dire straits because of that. Number three, they could not be scourged. The Roman citizen was not able, or by law, could not undergo scourging. And yet they were about to commence to scourge the Apostle Paul. They had already stood in violation of that second point. They had bound him. They had basically incarcerated him in the process of removing him from the Jews, treating him as a criminal, which was a violation of his Roman uh, citizenship, but if they scourge him, they would also violate that Roman citizenship because a benefit of that citizenship was he could not be scourged. And the fourth thing, he could appeal to Rome for justice, which we'll see him later doing in the book of Acts when he stands before uh, Festus and then uh, before Agrippa. So the chief captain then decides it's best to proceed in the right way. Interesting here that the chief captain, hearing these things, says in verse 29, and straightway they departed from him which should have examined him. That means they decided not to scourge him. They decided to undo his bonds. They were no longer going to treat him as though he was not a Roman citizen, but now they're going to, to give him or extend to him the full benefits of that Roman citizenship, and they're going to proceed with caution. They're going to do the right thing in the right way now because of what has been done. Now, keep in mind, he before that, he wasn't worried about doing the right thing in the right way. The chief captain was not. But now, suddenly, he is. And just another sub-point of application to you and I. We talked about the Christian life being a way, being a path to traverse, a way of life that we should have. Well, here's a part of that way of life that we should underline, we should underscore, and always implement. Always do the right thing because it is the right thing. Always do the right thing in the right way because it is the right thing. Not just because of the eyes being upon you, not just because of the potential uh, for punishment. Do the right thing because it is the right thing. You remember what Paul said to the Philippian brethren in Philippians chapter uh, 2 and verse number 12 when he said, told them to work out their own salvation. He said, as you have always done, not in my presence only, but also in my absence. He, he uh, bears witness to the Philippian brethren that, that that congregation was doing what was right because it was right, not just because his eyes were upon them. They weren't just doing right because Paul was overseeing or looking over their shoulder. They did what was right whether Paul was there to see it or not. And that's the way that we as Christians should be. We always do the right thing regardless of, of who's watching, regardless of what the outcome may be. We do the right thing in the right way because it is the right thing. That, and, and that by God's standard, not man's. And so just a sub point there, this, this man decides, well, we need to go ahead and have a trial. 
And so that's what's going to happen in chapter 23 of, of Acts. Paul is going to be given this hearing that the Roman citizenship demanded from the beginning that at the start this chief captain was not going to engage in. Uh, he was just going to get the cart before the horse. Let's go ahead and scourge him, beat out a confession. And, and for if not for Paul speaking to his Roman citizenship, um, bad things would have happened. So with chapter 23 and really the context of verse 1 through uh, 10, we're going to investigate the hearing. So as we think about it, and, and we'll see how time... Uh, advances here with this. We, we may not have time to get into all of it, but there is a subject matter that we want to investigate to begin with. Paul, now all of this happened the next day. Notice verse 30 of chapter 22. On the morrow, because he would have known the certainty wherefore he was accused of the Jews. That is, the chief captain wanted to know what the Jews were accusing Paul of. We're, we're going to have this hearing and, and we're going to determine whether Paul uh, meets the, the demands of condemnation or whether he does not. And he, he has to do this by Roman law because now he knows Paul is a Roman citizen. And so he's going to give occasion for the opposition, the Jewish leadership, to present their case, to hear as to whether or not Paul is guilty of some criminal activity, some crime for which he needs to be condemned, in this case, even unto death. And, and so as, as Paul is given the floor, it, it says he commanded the chief priests and all the council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. And Paul earnestly beholding the council, he sees all of this Sanhedrin council, this Jewish leadership around him. He says, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Paul begins his defense by presenting his argument, I have lived in good conscience. Now what Paul means is, and we're going to break this down a little more and understand the subject matter of the conscience. What Paul is saying is, in all my life, I have always done what I thought the right thing to do was. I have lived so as not to violate my conscience. Now, we understand something about that already. If you're listening to this Bible study, you're utilizing it to enhance your knowledge of God's Word, in, in particular through the book of Acts, then you have some knowledge already of the conscience, what the conscience is and, and what it's supposed to do and so forth. Well, in, in this case, Paul says... I have so lived to never violate my conscience. If I thought something to be the right thing, if, if I knew this was the right way to go, or at least in my uh, understanding of things, this was the right activity, then that's what I did. Well, think about what Paul has done here. When we first meet him as Saul of Tarsus, he is consenting unto the death of Stephen. That means at that time period, Paul thought that stoning Stephen was the activity that God desired him to be engaged in. He thought that condemning Stephen to death and putting him to death is what God's law demanded. Now, think about it. Saul was a, a participant. He was a, a man, uh, as a Jew, amenable to the Old Testament law. And it did mean that under that Old Testament law, a false prophet was to be put to death. So if Stephen had been a false prophet, then yes, the law demanded he be put to death. But Paul was working without full information there in that regard. He didn't understand the full, the full purpose of the law in getting men to Christ and then being nailed to the cross, taken out of the way, a law to which he was no longer amenable to follow. He needed to follow the law of Christ that had taken his place, the new covenant. But at that time, the, the, uh, the man Saul of Tarsus was doing what he thought was right. And then when he got those letters to go to Damascus and arrest Christians, he thought he was doing what was right in the sight of God. So he lived in good conscience. If he thought it was the right thing to do, he did it. If he thought it was the wrong thing to do, he didn't do it. 
And, and so he attests to this. this. This is his testimony. I've lived in all good conscience. So let's think about what that means. First of all, what is the conscience? Let's be clear about it and, and understand the biblical standard, the biblical concept and standard relative to the conscience and how you and I should live as Christians. Well, the, the conscience here, uh, the word, comes from a, a Greek word. And if you've listened to this for very long, you know that I'm not real good with pronun uh, pronunciation of Greek words. Uh, maybe it's the southern drawl, maybe whatever it is, I'm, I'm just not good. I tried to learn Spanish a little bit when I was in college, and I wasn't good at saying Spanish words either. Uh, so whatever language it is, I have trouble. And some would say, well, you even have trouble with the English language. Uh, Touche. Uh, but um, the, the word conscience comes from a Greek word that means moral consciousness or moral sense. Now, what does that indicate? What does that imply? Well, consider the fact that the mind of man is made up of, of different parts. There are four parts to the mind of man. There is, number one, the intellect. That capability of the mind of man to gather information and learn it. That the intellect, the, the, learn, uh, the means of learning concepts, the mean of, means of learning uh, facts, the means of gathering information. And in this case, as it pertains to the relationship to the conscience, it's the means of learning or gaining the concepts of right and wrong. So Paul says, in my life, I have applied myself to knowledge of God's word, knowledge of knowing what is right and wrong in God's standard, All right? So the intellect, the will, uh, another part of the mind, another, if you will, compartment of the mind, the volition of man is what drives the activity. Uh, the will of man is what drives the actions of man, the words of man, the thoughts of man. And, and that's another part. What, what, what is going to be done? What is going to be said? Well, the will of man drives that. That's the concept or the part of the mind that drives the action. So there's the intellect that is able to gain knowledge, the volition or the will of man that, that acts upon that knowledge, and then there is the conscience of man. And the conscience of man is that part that, that pertains to the will and the intellect. We know what was right and wrong, and we know whether our actions, as driven by our volition or our will, corresponded correctly to that knowledge of right and wrong. If our actions, driven by our volition, was according to that intellectual knowledge pertaining to right and wrong, it was in accordance with that which we knew to be right, then our conscience approves of it. If it was against that which we knew to be right, then it, it, it condemns us or it, it becomes guilty. It doesn't approve of us. And so Paul says, I've lived in good conscience. I have taken what I know to be right I have let that drive my activity, so I have acted in this way. And, and in knowing what was right and wrong, I always did that which I knew to be right. I, I stayed away from that which I knew to be wrong. Or in the case of having done wrong, I corrected it so that that violation would be forgiven. Lived with good conscience. Uh, intellect. Uh, let's break it down this way, kind of some easy terms. Intellect is where you gain the knowledge that two plus two equals four. The volition is what uh, drives you when you see that equation, two plus two, on the test or whatever it is, drives you to answer four. The conscience, however, is that part that knows whether or not you got that answer by cheating or not? How did you arrive at that answer? How did you get that answer? Did you go about it the right way? You learned it, and then you applied yourself to, to that answer 
or did you cheat to get that answer? And if you got it the right way, well, your conscience wouldn't be violated. If you got it the wrong way, your conscience would be violated. So the, the, the conscience just declares whether we came by the answer of 2 plus 2 equals 4 in the right way or the wrong way, by whether it's violated or unviolated. Now, there are some things that the Bible says the conscience can do. Like in Romans chapter 2 and verse 15, the conscience can bear witness uh, the, the, the purpose of the conscience here in, in this case, and as it is with Paul, uh, it bears witness to our activity. It indicates our activity as it, as it compares to the intellect that we have. It bears witness to whether or not we've done right or whether or not we've done wrong. It, it causes us to do right. Number two, according to Acts 24, 16, the apostle Paul says there, I hear and do do I and herein do I exercise myself to always have a good conscience void of offense. So it motivates or it drives him to do the right thing. I I go about my life or exercise myself. I act in a way so that my conscience will never be violated. Thus it causes or it motivates to do the right thing, but it can also condemn us according to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20. So while our conscience can bear witness to our activity, whether it's right or wrong, it can cause us to do right or it can be con uh, a condemning force because of its violation, a guilty conscience rather than an approving conscience or a good conscience. A good conscience would be one that is void of offense. And that's what Paul is saying he has here. My conscience is not offended because I've, I've exercised myself so as to live in a way that I do not violate it. So what we could say here as, as we live the Christian life, as we go along life's way, we always want to do the right thing because it's the right thing. We want to garner in our intellect knowledge of what is truly right and what is truly wrong, and then exercise ourselves or conduct ourselves in a way so as to not violate our conscience, so as to not live with guilt of sin. And so a good conscience is one void of offense. We don't, uh, we don't uh, violate it by, by thinking or doing or saying something that we know to be wrong or failing to do what was right in that situation. Uh, Romans 14, 23, Paul says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And he's talking there about doubting whether or not it's right. If there was any question in the mind as to whether something was right or not, he says, don't do it. That way you, you can be uh, of a good conscience. You won't violate your conscience. If you don't know that that activity is okay, it's right uh, to do, then don't do it. That way you don't violate your conscience. Now, that being said, we need, to, we need to train our intellect. We need to shape our intellect with facts, with truth. We need to know exactly what is right and what is wrong. And, and the, the standard for that is God's word. Don't, don't do it based on the fourth part of your mind, emotion, because your emotion can misguide you. Your emotion, if you live your life based on emotion doing things, saying things, acting in, in ways purely based on emotion, you're probably going to be wrong more than you're right. Uh, but shape your intellect to know what is right. God's word appeals to the intellect. The, the, the psalmist talked about it in, in Psalm 1, verse 1 and 2, about meditating on God's word day and night. Uh, the psalmist said in Psalm 119 and, and verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. What he's talking about is, is putting knowledge of God's word within the mind so, so he wouldn't sin. So we've got to have the right intellect. We know from Paul that he, he didn't violate his conscience. He lived so as to be void of offense in his conscience. But that didn't always mean he did the right thing. Thus we need to know precisely what is right and what is wrong. And then, knowing what is right and what is wrong, live by what is right, stay away from that which is wrong, 
so our conscience can be good. Now, as we think about the conscience, let us end by saying there are four things that can happen to the conscience. And knowing that there are four things that ha can happen to the conscience, we need to take care of it. We need to, to uphold the power of the conscience. That is, live so as it's void of offense. Gain the right knowledge of right and wrong. And then in our volition, let us live according to the will of God. Let us conduct ourselves in a way that conforms and comports to that way of life of the Christian. Knowing these four things, what can happen to the conscience? Number one, it can be seared, according to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. Some having seared their conscience. Now what that means is, when something is seared, uh, in the sense of burnt, to a point that all feeling is lost. You, you think about a brand, or a, a brand in the sense of branding of cattle, or or I've seen individuals that have branded themselves uh, because they're part of a, a social group or a social network. And th that place where that brand took place has been such a burn that it has killed the nerve endings, it has killed the nerves in that area of flesh that has been seared. There's no more feeling. And so what he's indicating there is some people have abused their conscience to a point that their conscience no longer feels. We might would, would term it, I think, sociopathic. Uh, the idea that they're, they have no feeling. He, Paul used the term past feeling. That, that they just have no means of, of, of sensing guilt or wrongdoing. They have no sense that what they did was wrong or what they said was wrong. So we want to be very careful. God created us with a conscience to help us maintain right. But if we abuse our conscience and we continually go against it, it can become seared. The conscience can be offended. Paul said he lived so as to be void of offense in his conscience, Acts 24, 16, which means the conscience can be offended. And we need to live carefully so that we don't offend it. Because if we continually offend our conscience, we'll get to that point where it is seared. We also know, thirdly, that from a passage like Hebrews 9, 14, or Hebrews 10, uh, 22, having our conscience sprinkled, the idea is it can be purged. So if there is that sense of offense, our conscience has been offended, we can purge it. We can cleanse it. We can remove it of that sense of guilt. 1 Peter 3, 21 talks about the answer of a good conscience toward God. And in that passage, he does say that, that uh, we, can, we can be saved. He, he talks about the like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. What does baptism do to help purge or cleanse the conscience? Well, it remits our sin. When we submit to the will of God, we're buried with Christ in baptism into his death. We contact his saving blood, the blood that was shed for the remission of sins. Our sins are then removed, meaning there is no longer guilt. We can have it purged. That sense of knowledge, that, uh, that sense of guilt that came with knowing we violated God's word, we can have that guilt removed, that we would no longer stand guilty of sin before God by obedience to his will and, and having that blood applied. And then once we enter into the light, we enter into Christ by means of baptism, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, then we can continue walking in the light as he is in the light. We can have fellowship one with another and we can have the blood of his son cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1 in verse number 7. So the conscience can be purged. If we do violate our conscience, and there is that, that sense of guilt now because we haven't done what was right or we have done that which is wrong, we can have it purged. We can have it cleansed by seeking that blood of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 7, though, he also says it can be weak. And so we want to strengthen it. 
And, and the strength of the conscience comes by gaining the correct knowledge, by training our intellect with the knowledge of what is right and wrong, and then continually living with, with a, a means of life or a way of life that will be void of offense. And the stronger, the stronger our, con- or our conscience will become stronger as we, we live uh, in such a way to be void of offense. And if the conscience is weak, we need to gain the right knowledge and then apply that knowledge in our volition to live in a certain way, think a certain way, talk a certain way that conforms with the will of God. So Paul says, I've lived in all good conscience unto this day. Now, once again, that's going to evoke a response from the high priest. We don't have time to talk about that response today, but we'll get into that next week in our study. For today, remember these three things. Christianity is a way of life. You are supposed to live a certain way, think a certain way, and talk a certain way. Now, that way is the way that is right. And we're always to live that way regardless of who's around us, regardless of who's watching us, always do what's right because it's right. Now, as it applies to the conscience, we need to be learning what that right way is. We have to gain that intellectual knowledge of what is right and what is wrong, and then we need to apply ourselves to do that which is right and that which is good. And then we can be pleasing unto God. Let us live uh, lives with consciences void of offense because we're doing the right thing because it is the right thing in the right way because it's the right way and live that Christian life the way we're supposed to, just like the Apostle Paul did. Until next week, God bless you as you study his word and apply those principles.